new examples. All right, I want to uh, speak this evening on John Senek, uh, but before I do, I want to read a verse from Second Timothy chapter four, verse five, uh, one that we're very well familiar with. It says, "But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions." Do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. And certainly that's a verse that fits the life of John Senek very well. John Senek uh, was born 12th of December in 1718, and he died on the 4th of July, 1755. So a very short life, 36 years on this earth. But what an impact he had in those 36 years. Uh, a man many have never heard of, uh, perhaps some of us have heard of him because of the hymn that we just had sung to us, number 40 in the Hymns of Worship Remem and Remembrance, or number 20 in the Believer's Hymn Book, Brethren, let us join to bless Jesus Christ, our joy and peace, he who bowed his head so low underneath our Lord of war. But generally speaking, he's not well known. However, he was part of what we know as the uh, the Methodist revival, and one of the key characters in the uh, the Methodist revival, particularly in Wales, a man called Howell Harris, who was a contemporary uh, of Wesley and Whitfield and all these different individuals. Uh, he heard all these men preach, and this is his opinion. He says, as he heard these different men preach, and they were men powerfully used of God in revival. Uh, he said, George Whitfield, without question, was the best preacher of the Great Awakening, uh, consistently good. But then he said, but after him, he would have to say that John Senek was the man. And uh, uh, more powerful than John Wesley, than Charles Wesley, some of the other ones that we've come to know and appreciate, uh, certainly uh, not an educated man. That's what gives us encouragement. A lot of these guys were were Oxford graduates. Remember the Holy Club at Oxford, uh, where you had men like Whitfield and Wesley. But but John Senek left school at 13, and so he certainly had no education whatsoever. Uh, he wasn't uh, trained, ordained clergyman of any kind, uh, and uh, yet uh, was greatly used of God in revival. We said that... Uh, Part of the reason why he's maybe not so well known is that the shortness of brevity of his life, uh, dying age 36, we, one wonders if he'd lived as long as men like Wesley, uh, perhaps we would have all have heard of John Senek, and uh, just as he would have been just as familiar to us as some of the other ones that we know so well. <laughs> as well as uh, this hymn that we've mentioned, Brethren, Let Us Join to Bless, he also wrote several other hymns. Uh, that uh, and, and parts of hymns, some of them that are in our hymn books. He was an, an English Methodist and later became a Calvinistic Methodist and then ended up as a Moravian evangelist. So he kind of moved through different groups that were involved in this Methodist revival period. And we'll learn why uh, he left the Methodists, why he left the Calvinistic Methodists, and why he ended up with the Moravians, as we consider his story uh, this evening. But he was born in Reading in England, uh, in Berkshire, uh, which is about 40 miles from London. Um, that would be uh, 64 kilometers for our Canadian brethren, uh, who we don't have any on this evening, but in case they listen afterwards, just so they understand their language too. And uh, he was um, he was born into an Anglican family and raised in the Church of England. However, his his historical background goes back to Bohemia, and he left there as a result of the persecutions. And you remember John Huss, uh, and uh, he being uh, basically burned at the stake as a heretic, and his followers were severely persecuted by the Catholic Church. And so his family were part of those Bohemian uh, believers, converts who fled, uh, and they some of them went, uh, as we know, to uh, uh, the, the the estate of Count Zinzendorf and were given shelter there. But others came to the UK, and his family came to the UK, and uh, his grandparents, who were the ones that originally came over uh, from Bohemia, uh, they became Quakers. Uh, when they were uh, came under the influence of George Fox, 
However, uh, his parents didn't want anything to do with the Quakers because uh, they, they, they weren't respectable and they wanted respectability and acceptance. So they joined the Anglican Church, which was kind of the, the sphere of respectability in that day. His parents weren't believers, but they were incredibly religious people. In fact, his mother was a strict disciplinarian, and uh, he he constantly wanted to get away from her legalistic and strict ways in the home, including uh, Sabbath rules, because they they saw the Sabbath as Sunday, the Christian Sabbath. But he wasn't allowed to do anything as a little boy. Basically, had to be quiet the whole day, and he hated it. And just look for any opportunity to get out from under that regime of his mother's strict discipline. At the age of nine, he heard his dying aunt proclaim, last night the Lord stood by me and invited me to drink of the fountain of life freely, and I shall stand before the Lord as bold as a lion. The word stayed with him for many years because she had such certainty of her eternal salvation and he had none. In fact, he lived daily with a fear of death and a concern about his soul. Being from a family of humble means, John was compelled at the age of 13 to leave school and seek an apprenticeship in London. He made eight trips to London on foot. And again, we said from Reading, that was a 40 mile trip, a 14 hour walk. And he, he made that trip eight times looking for work and each time came back uh, unsuccessful and not able to secure an apprenticeship uh, at any of those places. He had little money and what he had, he would spend on going to plays or gambling. He engaged in lying and petty theft. Of that period of his life, he later said, I had forgot Jesus and everlasting ages. I loved ungodliness more than goodness and to talk of lies more than righteousness. And he was aware of just how far away he was uh, from his religious upbringing and from the truth of eternal things. As a youth, uh, he delighted in attending dances, playing cards, going to theater. But in 1735, while walking hastily along Cheapside in London, he experienced a deep conviction of sin. These convictions were strengthened by his association with pious companions. He was greatly depressed in mind, and he did not yet possess true Christian peace. On the contrary, he went step by step down into the dark depths of spiritual despair. It's kind of interesting in those days. It seems that a lot of people went through a deep period of conviction before they were brought into light. And he certainly experienced that. However, um, the age of 17, once again, this heavy spirit came upon him. It, it had kind of lingered for two years, but it came with particular force this day. And until relief came, uh, he, he, he just felt like he wanted to die. He was so convicted. But one day he happened to go into a church and there he heard the vicar read from Psalm 34 and verse 19 through 22. And here are the words that particularly stood out to him. Great are the troubles of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. And then verse 22, he that putteth his trust in God shall not be desolate. He later said that he heard, as it were, the voice of Christ speaking to him. My heart danced for joy. My dying soul revived. I heard the voice of Jesus saying, I am thy salvation. I no more groaned under the weight of sin. The fears of hell were taken away. Christ loved me and died for me. I rejoiced in God my Savior. Senek worked for a time as a surveyor in Reading. He began reading the writings of George Whitfield. His sermons had been uh, kind of reproduced and were available, and he began to read them. And then through a friend, he was actually uh, at a friend's house, and they were actually going to play cards. And uh, he was so convicted that as a believer, he used to do that all the time as an unbeliever, as a believer, he should not be playing cards. And he said, I can't do that. I won't do that. Uh, please excuse me. 
And they said, oh, you sound like one of those guys at Oxford. And he mentioned a guy at Oxford who was part of the Oxford Holy Club. And he said, oh, uh, I've got to find that guy. And so he walked to Oxford to meet this man who had convictions about not playing cards. And uh, by the time he got to Oxford, he'd forgotten the guy's name. <laughs> and so he comes up at the campus looking for this guy who didn't want to play cards. Anyway, by a string of events, he ended up uh, coming into contact with John Wesley, Charles Wesley, George Whitfield, and the, the Oxford Holy Club. And that was a great blessing to him. In fact, uh, Wesley was so taken with him that uh, he asked him to become a teacher at Kingswood School in Bristol, uh, which was a, a school, one of the early Methodist schools. Uh, and so he went there and became a teacher on Wesley's recommendation. Uh, at Kingswood's uh, Hill, uh, outside the school, they used to have open air preaching to the miners that would come up from the coal mines. And uh, so he assembled with the open air preachers, but that day, the the preacher who should have been preaching didn't show up. And so everybody looked to Senek and said, you should preach. They urged him to step up and preach. Well, he hesitated. He reasoned with himself. I'm not prepared. He'd never preached before. He wasn't ordained as a minister. He had no license to preach. But there before him were the people waiting to hear the word of God. And a burden from the Lord came upon him, and he had to preach. And as he preached, it became very evident that this man was gifted by God as an evangelist. And so God opened an appointed path of evangelism, which would be the, the pathway of his life for the rest of his days. In fact, he became the first official Methodist lay preacher because Wesley had great qualms about unordained men preaching in the open air. And uh, and yet when he heard uh, Senek preach, he said he's so good. Uh, uh, but, he, but he said to him, he said, well, whatever you do, don't wear clerical garb. And, and I'm going to just call you an exalter. I don't want you to be called a preacher. You're just an exalter. But, but he recognized God had gifted this man as an evangelist. And he began to regularly preach in Bristol to crowds of up to 4,000 people uh, who would come to hear this man preach in the open air. At this time, this movement was in, in kind of its early days, and one of the kind of centers where people would meet together of like precious faith was in London in a place called Fetters Lane. There was a meeting house there, and some of the Moravians, Peter Bowler that influenced Wesley, others uh, of the uh, Whitfield, Wesley's brothers, others, Benjamin Ingham, would all come together, and uh, they would pray there, they would fellowship together there. And during some of the prayer meetings at Fetters Lane, George Whitfield describes the presence of God in those meetings is almost like he said it was like a fresh Pentecost. The Spirit of God came upon those prayer meetings, and they went out from there with such zeal to preach the gospel that it seemed like the, it was the birthplace, really, of the Methodist revival. And John Senek was one of those individuals who was privileged to be present in those meetings when the presence of God seemed to come so powerfully on the gathering. After teaching at the school for 18 months, Wesley became more involved in Bristol, and he began to teach Christian perfectionism. And immediately, uh, this caused a, a negative reaction in Senek. He just felt this is not biblical. He said he might be able to see it in Wesley, but he said, I certainly couldn't see it in his other men that went around preaching it. And so he just really had a difficulty with, with Christian per perfectionism. He also noticed that uh, Wesley became very um, uh, aggressively attacking Calvinism. Uh, and uh, again, in, in a spirit that uh, he found disturbing. Um, I'm no fan of Calvinism myself, but but we want to do it in a way of grace, grace and truth. And, and certainly he didn't see much grace in Wesley's uh, tirades against Calvinism. Um, 
And so as a result of these things, um, he was deeply concerned. And he wrote to Whitfield, who at that time was in America, and begged him to come back. He said, there's problems here. You've got to come back. Come back as quickly as you can. Somehow the letter that he wrote, telling the details of what was going on, somehow it found its way into the hands of John Wesley. <laughs> and so Mr. Wesley immediately set off for Bristol from London. And when he arrived, there was a love feast going on in the Kingswood School with the Methodist Society. And Wesley came in and in a very unloving manner, threw Senek out of his job and out of the church. Others were so disturbed by Wesley's brutal uh, treatment of this man that they left with him. And so 130 of them began what was the first meeting of what they called the Calvinistic Methodist Society. But Whitfield um, invited him to come to London upon his return uh, and to preach for him at Moorfields, which was uh, the Moorfield Tabernacle was Whitfield's church. And he went and preached and people just loved him. This this unordained, uneducated man, but had such a gift of explaining the gospel in power and simplicity. And after that, he and Howell Harris and Whitfield went around the villages of Wiltshire, which is a county in England, west of Reading, about 80 miles from London. And so they began to evangelize, and they did it for five years, evangelizing in that area of, uh, of Wiltshire. And so this is a description of the sufferings that he and his fellow evangelists endured, but he seemed to be the, the lightning rod. Uh, he often was the brunt of much of this. It says, John Senek was punched in the nose, beaten until his shoulders were black and blue, dunked in a dirty pond, sprayed with ditch water, blackened with musket smoke when he preached. Heckless tried to drown his voice by beating drums and pans, or they set dogs barking by swinging a cat in a cage. They hurled dead dogs at him. In spite of this terrible opposition, he preached outdoor sermons in Wiltshire for five years. And the reason was this, he wanted to win souls. And he was willing to pay a heavy price. He was willing to endure afflictions and do the work of an evangelist. Hundreds bowed the knee as Senek preached in the open air, as the spirit fell on the crowds, bringing people to a deep soul trouble and then to peace at the foot of the cross. And he saw multitudes come to Christ and several societies established in Wiltshire. There was also um, a time when Whitfield went back to America again, and when he went back to America, he offered his pulpit at the Moorfield Tabernacle in London to Senek. He felt there's no better man to replace me than him. And so he went and he loved it. He loved the preaching, but he hated the church politics. Uh, apparently, at the time he was there, there was almost a division over uh, removing a wall in the building. Isn't it amazing how people get so bent out of shape about buildings? Kind of, it's, it's a form of idolatry. I'm, I'm convinced that we've made idols out of the buildings. And that's that, this is the kind of stuff that was going on. And so he hated the church politics. And as a result, he became disillusioned and left. And he threw his lot in with the Moravians. This is how he described himself. He said, he was a person who goes before the church so it can be born. Isn't that a wonderful description of an evangelist? He goes before the church so the church can be born. In other words, he goes and pioneers and preaches the gospel, sees people saved, and then others can come in and do the shepherding and the tea and all the rest of it. That was his goal. Count von Zinzendorf said of Senek, this is the Apostle Paul revived. Now, I would say that's pretty good compliment. <laughs> this is the Apostle Paul revived. So why did he go to the Moravians? He said, I feel at home with people who make much of the Lamb of God. I think that's a beautiful statement, isn't it? He felt at home with people who make much of the Lamb of God. And speaking of the Moravians, he said he loved their warmth and friendliness. 
he felt that in the Calvinistic Methodists, there was this intellectualism that, that took away some of the warmth of fellowship. And they tended to look down on the uneducated and all the rest of it. And he felt that very keenly. And, and so he, he said, these people, I love their warmth. I love their friendliness. By the way, a lesson for us, uh, do we have warmth and friendliness in our meetings? He was invited to go to Dublin by two businessmen who heard him preach at the tabernacle. Whitfield still would ask him to come and preach there, even though he wouldn't stay permanently. And so he had to ask the Moravian committee if it was possible for him to go. They gave him his blessing. And so he began to preach in the city of Dublin. And it says people crowded to hear him preach about Christ. Even Roman Catholics warmed to his preaching. He led over 526 people into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ preaching in the streets of Dublin. And he said people would, would have to get there sometimes three hours earlier to be sure to get a place to hear him preach. When news of his uh, success in Dublin reached Northern Ireland, well, he was invited to come to Ballymena. Uh, Ballymena is the citadel of Presbyterianism in Northern Ireland. And so he went to, uh, to Ballymena and the Presbyterians absolutely hated him. <laughs> They hated him so much that he was driven out of town with a man chasing him with a horse whip and whipping him. But after two years, he decided to go back. And he went back to that place where he had been driven out. And he spent his last seven years in Northern Ireland planting 20 Moravian churches and establishing 40 Moravian societies through the preaching of the gospel some of them still exist today. There's a community in Grace Hill in County Armagh that is still connected with the Moravian movement. During the, his few years, remember he dies age 36, converted at 17, he preached somewhere between eight to 9,000 times. And everywhere he went, souls were gloriously saved. So what you might ask is that to do with revival? Well, here's, here's a glimpse of what revival is really looks like it well it was an it was an it started with a revival of god's people the fetters lane uh, experience of the empowerment of the spirit of god amongst the saints followed by a tremendous awakening but caused by men who went out in the highways and byways and compelled men to come in and i for one feel very convicted when i read the stories of these kind of men and say, Lord, would you do something in my heart to drive me out of my comfort zone to reach lost sinners with the gospel and even be willing to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ? You see, I think part of the reason we don't want to do the work of an evangelist is because with it comes endure afflictions. And we don't like that. We live in a very comfortable society. And we like that comfort too much. So anyway, there's just some thoughts on a man greatly used of God, John Senek. May the Lord use him to stir our prayers. Lord, do it again, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.